Hello from the UK. Apologies that I can't be with you all in Bishkek this year. However, I still wanted to present our research and definitely invite anyone who's interested in it to follow up with me via email or social media. All my contact information is on each of the slides. This particular piece of research is one that I collaborated with one of my master's students, Fiona Nazrion, and focuses on the influence of cultural and religious identifications in crisis communication theory. Last year, um, I had a bit of a project for myself. I decided to try and develop as accurate of a summary of the state of crisis communication research as I could by reviewing every journal article that I could find with the earliest emerging in 1953 right up to the end of 2015. This image gives you a rough snapshot of how the key concepts related to culture and religion have been covered in crisis communication research and quite frankly that picture isn't particularly good. In fact, the study of the impact of religious identities and preferences doesn't even emerge as a critical concept studied in the context of crisis communication. For example, between 1953 and 2015, there have been fewer than 10 individual peer-reviewed journal articles focusing specifically on religion and crisis communication. Yet this comes on the back of, of intercultural crisis communication research representing an important development in both the fields of intercultural communication and crisis communication as intercultural issues fuel many of the conflicts at all levels of society and we know that crises are increasingly global. The need for more of this kind of research is strengthened when we consider a few key findings on the influence of culture and religion. For example, previous research demonstrates that both culture and religion influence people's attitudes and perceptions, of course. But this also suggests that multinational organizations may be able to minimize or even avoid crises by communicating more effectively with local populations. Additionally, as Stevens' research points out, conflict management, a construct most certainly related to crises, is of course influenced by religion as well. Yet to date, very little empirical research directly analyzes the influences of religious identifications in crisis communication. But what studies there are, the case studies do indicate that stakeholders are likely to react negatively when crises or related issues violate their religious beliefs. So to begin to fill this aforementioned gap in the literature and build interculturally relevant crisis communication theory, this research aims to examine how different people, different cultures and religions assess crises by understanding their perception of crisis severity and the organization facing crises, as well as trying to figure out if there are particular crisis response preferences, especially when the crises violate religious beliefs. So this was our first examination of the data. There will certainly be more development on this. But in taking a look at some of the key factors that we're looking at here, we begin with culture. This was operationalized in three ways, in terms of national identification, as well as other important cultural dimensions. So while uncertainty avoidance is often associated with evaluations of nationality regarding crises, uncertainty is also of particular interest as cultural identification because crises themselves generate additional uncertainty. So it's been evaluated as a really strong predictor in evaluations of crisis severity. Religion was also operationalized in a few different ways. Initially, of course, we asked people to identify their religious affiliations. However, a substantial amount of research and common sense suggests that while people may identify with particular religious affiliations, not all people are equally religious. Therefore, if we're to understand the influence of religion on crisis, we should also ask the question about how the degree of religiosity influences people's attitudes. Finally, there's also a strong tradition of associating individualism and collectivism with different religious traditions. For example, Protestant religions are often associated with individualistic values, whereas religions like Islam are often associated with collectivist values. 
So while traditionally a, a national cultural factor, in this case we wanted to ask if individualism and collectivism could be associated with different religious identifications. Then, of course, in terms of severity, the, think of severity as both the actual impact and the perceived impact of a crisis. It's been identified as a critical factor in the selection of crisis response strategies and other assessments of outcomes for organization. But one of the outcomes that remains absolutely vital is the, an organization's reputation the perception of the organization, how valued it is, how positively people look at it. So with severity and reputation, these type of outcome variables end up being a central focus for a lot of other types of outcome variables. So we're looking at this. So what happened in this study was that respondents read a brief profile for a real company in their country, and then they were asked to evaluate the company, their attitudes about the company, and their perceptions just in general about the company. They were presented then with a scenario that pork products had been found in a food product labeled as appropriate for vegetarians and on religious grounds. So then they were asked to evaluate the severity of the problem without taking into consideration the role of the organization. After that, respondents were given four brief blame attribution scenarios. One where the company was at fault and had actively covered up the problem. The second where the organization, it had happened, but there was no evidence that the organization had known about it. Third, that it was the result of product tampering. And then fourth, that at this point, the report was simply an unverified rumor. So the respondents were asked to compare and contrast these explanations of the crisis in terms of the potential damage to the organization that they had been thinking about. Finally, respondents were, asked, were introduced to four possible crisis response strategies. A defensive response, one focusing on the organization's social responsibility, a third focusing on the organization's image, and fourth simply information about the crisis, and then ask to evaluate those strategies on their own, and then match those up with the situation as best they thought. So when we take a look at our the participants that we had, we had a pretty nice diverse mix. Uh, you'll notice though that we had quite a large Chinese sample, also quite a large Malaysian sample, but as a point of comparison we also had United Kingdom, Czech Republic, and a small proportion of uh, folks from Mauritius. We also had a nice diverse religious uh, back, set of backgrounds, um, with most though associated with no religion, um, proportionately speaking. But then a large number of Muslims, Christians, Buddhists, and atheists. Um, so if we take a look at the results that we had, so the first comparison we looked at was the influence of cultural identification onto crisis severity. So as you can see, there were some, some unexpected kinds of implications. There are no main effects for countries. And then countries with low levels of uncertainty avoidance generally perceive the crisis as more severe. Um, this, was, this is what we would have expected, but what the post hoc test suggested was that separating nations or separating um, uncertainty avoidance by nation is not particularly productive. But that high uncertainty avoidance respondents evaluate the crises as more severe. So there are a few possible explanations for these findings. First is that examining uncertainty avoidance as a nation, uh, national attribute is actually quite problematic. Second, Uncommon crises or incidents such as outbreaks or newly found viruses, pandemics, you know, big time crises are probably more likely to produce higher levels of uncertainty than situations like that presented in this study. Because the uncommon or, or more dramatic situations inspire a high de higher degree of fear and so probably raise much more uncertainty. And then third, that respondents may have perceived the damage as less severe 
because it's an ethical or religious violation compared to one risking property damage or people's lives. So in short, while people may be angry at the organization, they don't necessarily perceive the crisis as particularly severe. Second, we took a look at the influence of cultural identification on perceptions of the organization. What we find is that there are really no effects in terms of the tampering or the unsubstantiated rumor. The interesting ones, though, are really much more about where the organization's at fault and the direct attribution of blame. Again, research focusing on uncertainty avoidance as an individual attribute rather than as a national one is likely to be much more effective of a conceptualization. However, these findings do indicate that there are some important national differences in terms of how organizations facing kind of routine crises are likely to be perceived by different stakeholder groups. So it's useful to note that in the two types of crisis where the organization is not to blame, stakeholders are quite rational. This bodes well for organizations who face these types of crises and suggests that crisis communication efforts should be focused very differently based on different types of crisis. This is quite consistent with most of the crisis research. Third, we looked at the relationship between religious identifications and crisis severity. And again, we didn't find that nationality has the same kind of influence that re religious identification did. In this case, these findings suggest that religion might be a much more useful categorization for individualist and collectivist cultures compared with nationality. That for those who have a religious identity, there are also important cultural factors that accompany them. So for folks who are religious, this is a critical identification um, that certainly in the crisis literature is vital to develop a much stronger understanding of. Fourth, the question of how religious identification influences an organization's reputation is actually really interesting based on these findings. Much like the cultural factors, it's really useful to identify for crisis communication that religiosity in general doesn't necessarily affect the reputational evaluations for crises when the organization is not to blame, so the product tampering and the unsubstantiated rumors. However, what's really interesting are the opposing results for the other two types of crisis. So in the transgression, where not only was the situation evident, but where there's also evidence that the organization had known about it and covered it up, people who are more religious were significantly more likely to judge the organization negatively than people who are not as religious. But that's in direct opposition to the scenario where the pork products found their way into the food, but there was no evidence that the organization knew or had covered anything up. In this case, people who were more religious were significantly more forgiving to the extent that the reputation of the company in crisis actually increased, suggesting a really different level of empathy for the organization, even though it still likely um, caused the violation of religious principles. Then finally, we looked at the relationship between religious identification and response strategy preferences. Now, in terms of breaking this down into each of the type, four types of crisis response, what we found initially for the defensive response, where an organization denies some kind of involvement, was that the defensive response was universally disliked in the situation, and the social responsibility response was much more preferred. Um, however, in the case of, of where it happened, but there was no evidence where the organization knew, it's interesting that for the defensive strategy, where the organization wasn't at fault, those who were Muslim and Hindu wanted to see the organization defending itself. Now, coupled with the re reputation finding, it suggests that some religious identities may want to actively see the organization speaking publicly about situations, even when they're not at fault. However, this certainly wasn't a universal desire, as the findings for the Buddhists demonstrate.
Uh, it's also useful to note that the social responsibility strategy was the most favored in general. But when it comes to product tampering, the response preferences here generally were less clear. Other than to say that the, Im the image-oriented strategy was viewed as generally less desirable, um, there weren't a lot of differences in terms of, of different religious identifications. But when we come to the unsubstantiated rumors, these stand in direct opposition to the second group where the organization, it happened, but there was no clear blame attribution. So we see the exact opposite result for the defensive strategy that we saw in that case. For Buddhists, an organization defending itself in the case of unsubstantiated rumors was highly desirable, yet that was not necessarily the case with Muslims and Hindus. So, when we look overall, what we can see across this study is that both cultural and religious identifications significantly influence the perceptions of crises, organizations affected by the crisis, and crisis response strategies. This particular analysis has a few limitations in terms of operationalization and testing, so future analyses that we're running are going to revisit the project to be a lot more detailed and a lot more specific. However, as an early investigation into the question about the relevance and the importance of different cultural and religious identifications, we're really confident that these data demonstrate that a focus on intercultural crisis communication, inclusive of different types of evaluations of culture, and most certainly cultural influencers like religious identification, is essential if our field's going to develop an understanding of how crises influence stakeholders and also to match the best possible crisis response strategies for different populations, so that quite frankly we're just not tone deaf to their communication needs. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback about this research, please, again, don't hesitate to get in contact with me.